I'm never looking back. I surrender all. I'm living for your glory on the earth. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow, for all the world to know. I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow. For all the world to know, I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. For every knee to bow down, for every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, burn like a fire in me. For every tongue to confess that you alone are the king, you are the hope of the earth, burn like a fire in me, in me. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. A fire in me, burn like a fire in me. A fire in me, burn like a fire in me. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad to have you here this morning. Thanks for braving the tropical storm. Glad you're all out and safe. And uh, I guess Huntsville City Schools will cancel tomorrow. Probably. That's our and and, and Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> hey, if you're a guest this morning, thanks for coming out to be with us. Welcome to Twickenham. If you're looking for a church. We are always looking for new family members. We're just glad you're here. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out and place that in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later in our service. And please indicate any prayer requests that you have on that card, and we will be praying about those first thing tomorrow morning. If you want the whole church to pray about it, you indicate that. If you just want the uh, staff and elders, indicate that. So either way, we'll, we will lift up whatever your concerns are. Speaking of concerns... Last week, uh, we began our service with a, a special prayer for the folks up in Antioch, Tennessee, um, at the Burnett Chapel Church uh, because of the shooting that occurred there. One was killed and several others were wounded. And then we sang that classic hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. It was a good service last week as we thought about that. And then 12 hours later, we received the news that a madman had killed almost 60 people in Las Vegas and wounded hundreds and hundreds of others. So if you ask the question why this week, you're not alone. And if you ask the question, where is God in all of this, you're not alone either. I ask those questions. In fact, I was, I was pretty troubled by that, that we'd prayed about it and then this thing had happened. And so later in the week, I started looking at that old song, It Is Well With My Soul, and discovered that there are some other verses that are not in your typical church library. And one of those verses goes like this, and it, it really seemed to move me towards some answers. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Before the shooting in Antioch, and before the shooting 
in Las Vegas and before Columbine and Sandy Hook in Vietnam and Korea and World War II and one and all the way back before every other global tragedy before every personal crisis that any of us have experienced throughout history, before all of that, God had a plan to intervene on our behalf for our helpless estate. And he came in the person of Jesus Christ. That was his plan. wasn't plan B or C or D. That was plan A, that Jesus would come and through peace and love and grace destroy hate and violence and death. Now you and, and me and a lot of other folks around the world have already bowed the knee to this Savior and to this King, but a lot of other people haven't. And so that's why we see hate and violence and death. One of these days, however, every knee will bow to him and there will no longer be any hate or violence or death. One of these days, every knee will bow to that king. This morning, we're going to be talking about a king who was humbled, but we're going to be celebrating a humble king who was born in a barn, who was killed on a cross, who was laid in the tomb, and who rose victorious. That's who we're here to celebrate. Let's stand, let's sing, let's praise the Lord for who he is and what he has done. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. There is no other name. No name by which we're saved. There is no other name but Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. Every knee shall bow at Every knee shall bow at his at the name, name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Remain standing as we read together. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, because you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again. 
again, one voice. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams, in my darkest hour. This time we set aside to partake of the Lord's communion. It's where we uh, eat of emblems that represent God's broken body and we drink that which represents his shed blood. It's a very, it's a very humbling experience for those of us who, who participate in this communion. It represents for us the ultimate, the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate show of love. I've been asked this morning uh, to read Philippians chapter 2 uh, verses 1 through 11 in conjunction with the supper. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along with me. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. So by whatever strengthening and consoling and encouraging, by whatever persuasive incentive there is in love, by whatever participation in spirit, and by whatever depth of affection and compassionate sympathy, fill up and complete my joy by living in harmony and being of the same mind and one in purpose, having the same love, being in full accord and of one harmonious mind and intention. Do nothing from factional motives, contentiousness, strife, selfishness, or for unworthy ends, or prompted by conceit and empty arrogance. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, let each regard the others as better than and superior to himself. Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not his own interest, but also each for the interest of others. Let the same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained but stripped himself so as to assume the guise of a servant, of a slave, and that he became like men and was born a human being. And after he appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name, 
that in the name of Jesus, every knee must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Would you bow with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for this ability and opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. It is so meaningful and so needed. It's quite appropriate considering all the things that are going on in our world today to recognize and remember that you still sit on the throne, that you're still in charge. It's appropriate this morning to remind ourselves of how you humbled yourself even as Lord. It's appropriate this morning in light of the conditions and the challenges that we face, that we are reminded to esteem others superior to ourselves. It's appropriate to remind ourselves to be concerned about the interest of others. Heavenly Father, Sovereign Lord, ruler of the universe, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you adoration. In your son's name, amen. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. 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 And he, and he will, live, will lift you up. And he, and he will live lift you up. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And He, and he, he died, died for us. And He, and he died, died for us. So humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he As we partake of this emblem representing your shed blood, Lord, we recognize and remember that you omitted no one, that the cleansing power of your blood was for all humanity. 
that you look upon us as worthy to be saved. That you love us in all of the variances that we have. Help us as those who are disciples of yours to emulate those same views and those same principles. In your name, amen. This is my worship, lifted up for you, the Holy One of Heaven, the worthy Lamb of God. Please hear my cry for mercy, I come humbly to your throne, and offer up my life to you. I come humbly to your throne and offer up my life to you and you alone. You're my God, my King, my Nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's stand. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, we strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Art, thank you for leading us this morning in that communion time. And Lincoln team, great job this morning. You guys are a blessing to our church. A couple of uh, program notes here. Um, tonight we are having the spring at 5 o'clock. So you come on out and be with us. Hurricane, it's the hurricane spring. So come join us tonight at 5 o'clock. Up here, downstairs. 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 So about five o'clock. And then um, in November, we're going to start a new series of messages called The Problem. And we're going to be talking about um, what is called the, 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 the classic problem of evil. Uh, formulated uh, rather simply that if God is all good and all knowing and all powerful, then why is there evil in the world? There's a lot of that a lot of that going on right now, and so it's a good time for us to confront a, a difficult issue. We'll be, begin that in November, no, the first Sunday in November. Be praying about that. A great thing to invite friends to join you, even a really good uh, thing to uh, invite skeptical friends to join us as we try to wrestle with some deep, deep issues. The problem that begins first Sunday in November. So you know, uh, we're, uh, we're in Daniel, by the way, uh, chapter 4 this morning, Daniel chapter 4 in this uh, current series, Even If. You know those glowing family holiday newsletters that you'll be getting in a few months, the ones that come with this picture of this perfectly happy family and they're all thin, they have all their teeth and detailed report chronicling all the awesome that 
happened the previous year. I hate those men. Amen. I hate those. So I know you're going to send me one now, but I hate them, all right? So anyway, there's this, uh, there's a theologian with whom I disagree on just about everything named Frederica Matthews Green, but she had a little fun with those newsletters, and, and here she created a fictional family called the Lamplighters. They even have a cool name, right? Wouldn't it be cool if your last name was Lamplighter? So it goes like this. It's been a great year for the Lamplighters. Greg had been hoping for promotion, but what a surprise when the CEO came to his desk and begged him to take over the company. Whole office chipped in, gave the family a week in Paris to celebrate. Wasn't that nice? Of course, Jean's been busy as well. You probably saw the news about how she rescued a bus, school bus full of children from a kidnapper armed just with a plastic comb. Nice to think, too, that the poem she wrote for last year's letter is chiseled into the wall of the Library of Congress. Twins did so well at the state tap dance championship that Steven Spielberg is crafting a movie around them, and little Greg Jr.'s science fair project was the topic of much excitement in the New England Journal of Medicine. I have relatives like this, okay? Not anymore. So. Daniel chapter 4 is honestly is a, is a little bit like that. Um, it, it's a letter from an ancient Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar. And we're not going to read all of it because it's it, kind of like his name. It's really too long. But it, here's how it begins. And, and you're going to hate the guy as soon as it starts. Because it starts, King Nebuchadnezzar to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth. If you address a letter to everybody, come on, you must think you're something. May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom, his dominion endures for generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. And you, you already, you want to punch the guy. You get the impression that this is going to be an insufferable celebration of all the, the greatness that is Nebuchadnezzar. He's in his palace. He's at peace. He's prosperous. But then he does something that, that these holiday newsletters hardly ever do. He gives you the unvarnished truth about what's really been going on in his life. Verse 5, I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So it starts with peace and palatial prosperity, and then all of a sudden it goes to fear and abject terror. So what, what was the dream? Well, the king saw a tree. It was a huge tree. It was a tree that, that uh, was visible to the whole world. Its, its top touched the sky. You got to wonder what was it with Babylonians and tall things. They have the Tower of Babel back in Genesis and then the nine-story idol that Nebuchadnezzar bit, built and, and now a tree that dwarfs Mount Everest. Every living creature lived under this tree. Every living creature ate fruit from this tree. This tree is basically the tree of life for the whole world. And then this angel comes down and orders that the tree be stripped of its leaves and branches and be cut down. And the only thing that was left was a stump. And the dream ended with this ominous announcement in verses 15, 16, and 17. The angel says, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal until seven times, most scholars think that seven years, pass by for him so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest people. Now, if you've been around for, for previous episodes in this series, you can guess what comes next. 
because this has happened before. The king calls together his royal soothsayers and dream weavers, but they are unable to interpret the dream. They never fail to fail, which makes you wonder why he keeps them on the payroll. But he finally does what he should have done to begin with, and he calls for Daniel, and even Daniel is perplexed, but not because he doesn't understand the dream. He understands the dream perfectly. He just doesn't want to be the guy that gives the king the bad news because, you know, the messenger, right, does not always survive. But the king insists on being told, and so, so Daniel tells him, you're the tree, you're awesome, and you're huge, and you're the biggest thing on the planet, but you're about to be cut down to size. You're not just going to be driven out of your palace, you're going to be driven out of your mind until you acknowledge God. But once you do, you'll be restored to your former glory and sanity. So if I were you, king, what I would do is I would start now, I would renounce my sins, and I would do what is right, and I would show kindness to the oppressed. And then they sang five verses of just as I am, but Nebuchadnezzar did not come forward. Daniel is thanked and dismissed. And he goes on about his business. Verse 29, 12 months later, King is walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon. And if you, if you re- read a lot of the Bible, you, you see a, a person of authority up on the roof, you know something bad's about to happen. Because it, all through Scripture, whenever powerful people get up on high places, nothing good comes of it. You got Nebuchadnezzar here. Earlier in the Bible, you had David up on his roof. That did not turn out well. Later on, you had Jezebel, the wicked queen Jezebel. She's at a third story window and a couple of disloyal subjects give her a little push and what happens next makes Stephen King's it look like Dr. Seuss. So the king is walking around on the roof of his palace, looking out on his grand city, The palace itself was spectacular. It was called a marvel of mankind. That was the name they gave the palace, the marvel of mankind. And maybe he could even see the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a a garden he created for his wife so that it would remind her of the mountains back home. And he's standing there on his roof, and he's looking out there at all of this awesome And he's just overcome with pride. And he says, is not this the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty, I am awesome. And the next thing you know, he's living in the woods and he's eating vegan And he looks like what you'd get if you put Ernest T. Bass, Jack Nicholson, and Gary Busey in a blender. He looks awful. And he stays that way for seven years. Seven years. Then verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High and glorified him who lives forever. And he adds in verse 36, my honor was restored, uh, returned, and I was restored. Earlier in this story, every time a servant would come in to speak to Nebuchadnezzar, they would say, oh, king, live forever. Now Nebuchadnezzar's the one who's going, I'm not the one who lives forever. He is the one who lives forever. And when he did that, he was restored. That's not your typical holiday newsletter right there. So I want to look at three takeaways with you. First, and primarily, this is a story that teaches who is in control. This is a story about who is in charge. As usual, uh, in, um, when you start getting into some of the, the commentaries and the scholarship on a book like Daniel, there's disagreement about when it was written. Um, My sense is that it was authored by Daniel himself toward the end of his 70-year career as an expatriate Hebrew serving under three different non-Hebrew administrations, Babylon, Medes, and the Persians. Other people think it was written centuries later when Israel was under the boot of Greek or Roman oppressors. Either way, 
the, the first part of the book, the message in the early part of the book is the same. No matter who sits on the throne and no matter, no matter where the throne is or when the throne is, no matter who lives in the palace, God is in control. God is in charge. Verse 25 puts it very bluntly. The Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, and He gives them to anyone He wishes. That was true then. I think that's true now. Now, if you were a Hebrew living in a, in a Babylonian dictatorship, Knowing that God could drive the king not only out of his palace, but out of his mind was a very empowering thought. Even though it was proleptic, even though there was a sense that it's, not, it's now and not yet, you, knowing that God was in control was a big deal to you. It's a big deal for us. Because for all of their power and success, for all of their terror and authority, there is not a single dictator, despot, Emperor, czar, president, king, queen, monarch, autocrat, or chief who can claim an eternal government. They are all provisional. They are all temporary. Only Jesus is eternal. Six centuries before Jesus, Nebuchadnezzar said that God's kingdom is eternal and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Six centuries before Jesus, he said that. Twenty centuries after Jesus... People are still ordering their lives and arranging their priorities and submitting their decisions to the lordship of Jesus. And the only people who pay attention to Nebuchadnezzar these days are archaeologists, historians, and people who are studying the book of Daniel. The idea that God is still in control, is still in charge, still matters. Before it was liberated from ISIS, Christians in Mosul, Iraq, endured incredible oppression. ISIS soldiers marked Christian homes with the letter N for Nazarene. And they told them, you have three choices. You can convert, you can leave, or you can die. Ten years ago, there were 35,000 Christians living in Mosul. Now there are about 30. The Center for the Study of Global Christianity estimated that between 2005 and 2015, over 900,000 Christians had been martyred around the world. The organization Open Doors has documented, not estimated, documented over 1,300 attacks on Christian church buildings since November 2015 around the world. Here in the U.S., we are not oppressed for our faith. We get some cultural pushback, but what we experience is not even in the same universe as what Christians in other parts of the world endure. But the idea that God is in charge is still a critical lesson for us. That puts our politics in perspective. We, we get really amped up about politics and who's in the White House and who's in Congress and who said what and who did what and what are they going to do? Look, what happens in Washington or Montgomery or City Hall in Huntsville or the political maneuverings at your job or at your school are all important, but they are not ultimate. God's in charge. That's what this story is about. And second, this is a story about pride, arrogance, self-sufficiency. Nebuchadnezzar is the poster boy for runaway pride. Apparently his mother read him a 6th century B.C. version of the Dr. Seuss book, All the Places You Will Go, and he believed every word of it, especially the part about being as famous as famous can be. It's really easy to pick on King Nebuchadnezzar because A, he's dead, and B, he's not me or you. And it is insanely difficult to see pride in ourselves. It doesn't show up in a mirror when you look. Jason Meyer calls pride a shape-shifting sin. You get a sin like lust or, or racial bigotry or lying. Those are pretty obvious. You know, they, they kind of stand out. Pride? Slippery. Sneaky. It's a chameleon. Can't hardly see it. So let's ask some questions. 
to kind of check our humility gauges here, okay? I'm going to tell you up front, these are going to leave a mark, all right? Because they, I went back through them this morning and I went, I don't really want to say that because they hit me. These come from a, a, an 18th century preacher named Jonathan Edwards. You may have heard of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He talked actually more about grace than he did hell, but these are good questions. Number one, we're checking our humility gauges here. Do I frequently find fault in others? Edwards said, the eminently humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart that he is apt to be, not apt to be very busy with the hearts of others. Now, if you're thinking of somebody else right now who really needs to hear that, I don't even have to finish that sentence. You caught that. Good. Do I find fault with others? Number two, am I impatient with the failings of others? I'm, I'm a, it's a pretty safe confession here, but I will confess to you, I am an arrogant driver. Anybody who's driving slower than me is an idiot. Anybody that's driving faster than me is a jerk. If I cut somebody off, that was an accident and it was unintentional and accidents happen. Ease up. Somebody else cuts me off, it is a personal assault on my manhood. And sometimes I live like I drive. Edwards said, Christians who are but fellow worms ought at least to treat one another with as much humility and gentleness as Christ treats them. Do I, do I, am I impatient with the failings of others? Number three, ah, am I image obsessed? Am I image obsessed? Blogger Fabian Harford writes, when pride lives in our hearts, we are far more concerned with others' perceptions of us than the reality. We fight the sins that have an impact on how others view us and make peace with the sins no one else sees. We have great success in the areas of holiness that have highly visible accountability but little concern for the disciplines that happen in secret. Because to the proud, the most important thing is image, not the reality. Number four, do I love the least of these? Do I love the least of these? If pride's my problem, I'm going to court relationships with power people, people who enhance my image, who enhance my status, who raise my creds, people who contribute something to my social bottom line. I'm going to work hard to always be at the cool kids table or in the cool kids group at school or at work or at church. I want to be in the bubble. Romans 12, 16, Paul said, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Number five, where's my hope? Where's my hope? Edward Mote um, was born in 1797 in London. His parents owned a pub, never went to church. But when he was 15, he heard the preaching of a pastor named John Hyatt, and he became a Christian. For most of his life, he was a cabinet maker, but when he turned 55, he became a preacher and a hymn writer. His most famous hymn originally started with the words, nor earth nor hell my soul can move, an acknowledgement that when it comes to changing things, either here or in eternity, we are basically powerless. The first lines were later edited to something more familiar, familiar that we sang just a minute ago. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Jesus' blood and Jesus' righteousness, not my own. Look, if your hope of heaven, your hope of a relationship with God is built on your own performance, your own morality, your own doctrinal precision, your own religious rightness, you might want to check your humility gauges. And if you think that your sin 
is too wicked and too messy and too scandalous for God to forgive, then basically what you're saying is that your sin is greater than his grace. In a weird way, that's pride too. Pride, slippery, shapeshifter. So this is a story about who's in control. This is a story about pride. And finally, this story in Daniel 4 is about restoration. It's about not giving up on people. It's about not giving up on ourselves. Nebuchadnezzar was undoubtedly one of the most unpleasant people who has ever lived. He was arrogant, he was mean, he was ruthless, he was self-centered, he promoted injustice, he used violence, he was an oppressor's oppressor. He oppressed the oppressors, that's how bad he was. If there was ever a human being who deserved a reserved parking spot in the lake of fire, it's Nebuchadnezzar. And God humbled him, not to crush him. God didn't, God didn't humble him to crush him. God humbled him to refine him and restore him. He gave Nebuchadnezzar a shattering experience. And that shattering experience is what helped him find his way to God. You may be enduring a shattering experience of your own right now. It could be marriage trouble, it could be a sickness, it could be financial ruin, it could be personal failure, it could be moral breakdown, it could be social insolvency. It could be anything. And it may be precisely because of some decisions you made, or it may be you're the catching the collateral damage from the decisions that somebody else made. Whatever it is, why ever it is, your shattering experience could be your way back to God or your way to God for the very first time. God has been known to use pulverizing moments to do mighty works in a person's life. Hey, can you guys come on back up? One of my favorite words shows up four, four times in the last part, or the last half of this story in Daniel chapter 4. Favorite word of mine. The word is restore. Four times that word comes up. And I love that word restore. I love the word because I know what it means to be restored. I know what it means to be returned. I know what it means to be reconnected. I know what it means to be re commissioned. You were a part of all of that for me. It is humbling and it is glorious and it is nothing but pure, pure grace. You may know somebody right now who is living in a, in a season of shattering. Let me just urge you not to give up on them. Don't give up on them. Because God can restore and return and reconnect them. You may be in a shattering season right now. And I'm going to ask you not to give up on God or on yourself because you can be restored. You can be returned. You can be reconnected. I know this. I know this because the Bible talks about another king, one very unlike Nebuchadnezzar. This king never stood on the roof of his palace and boasted about all his accomplishments. He didn't even have a palace to stand on. And he didn't dream that he was a tree of life for the whole world, but he was nailed to one. And he did give life to everybody. And I know that in his eternal, enduring kingdom, there is always, always, always hope for restoration, for being returned, for being reconnected. In the story that we looked at this morning, when the king in Daniel 4 renounced his sins and raised his eyes to heaven, he was returned. Can you imagine the holiday letter you'd get to send this year if you did the same thing? Raise your eyes. 
renounced your sin, and was returned to the Lord. Oh, you could send that one to me. I'll read it. We're going to have an invitation this morning. We don't ordinarily do that. Some churches call it an altar call. It's just a time to say, hey, if you're ready to make that move this morning, we're ready to take that step with you. We'll walk with you through that, whatever it means. Even if you don't know what it means, we'll, we'll begin to walk that journey with you. All you got to do is let us know, and we'll take those steps with you. If you're ready to give your life to Christ in baptism this morning, we would be thrilled to witness that. Or if you just want to begin a conversation about it, we would love to sit down, open our Bibles together and reason together over that. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, and if you need to come, you come on down. We'll pray with you. Just as I am without one plea, but that Oh, 
blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm welcome with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. Praise God, just as I. Can we just take a moment and just be here with him just as we are? Praise God just as and the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Oh, let's see. I'm supposed to do announcements and I don't want to. There is a wedding shower today from 1.30 to 3. Please remember that. It's for Dylan Pollard and his fiance, Emily. And that will be down in the Mercy Building. We are going to have the spring tonight even if it rains buckets. And we're going we're gonna to talk about peace tonight in a troubled time. We're just going to be in the presence of God and worship together and just pray for peace. And I think that's all I'll say. I hope you have a great day and week, and I'm going to dismiss us in prayer. God, mighty God, the Savior, the giver of mercy and grace, May we be humbled in your presence at all times and in all ways. And may others see through that humbleness the servant of your son Christ who died to give us what we now have and that is hope of eternal life. May you be glorified and honored in everything that we do throughout this week until we meet again. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree say, amen. Have a great day.